Welcome back to a very special YouTube exclusive version of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am pleased and honored to have our guest on the show today. But before we introduce him, I want to preface this whole conversation by saying this. On Monday, October 3rd, the people of Quebec will be heading to the both polls to elect their next government. They are have been in an election since the, I want to say, end of August, beginning of September. And Francois Legault, the current premier, is leading in the polls. And 125 members of the National Assembly will be elected on October 3rd. So I want some background. I have been following this election as closely as possible, but I want to bring in someone who I've been following during this Quebec election, and he is the host of the Backstage Podcast. He is the host of the QC Brief, and he is also the co-host of Just Us Dads, uh, George Centrisos. George, welcome to the show. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you so much for having me, man. I appreciate it. It's good to meet you. <laughs> Good to meet you as well. Like I said, I have been following your show for some time now. I love your interviews. I, I, I watch the English ones. I can't say my French <laughs> is the best, but I have been uh, admired by the uh, wealth of people that you've had on your show. Uh, before we get into the election, I want to talk about your show a little bit here. Where did the idea for the show, uh, the Backstage Podcast and QC Brief come from? Yeah, well, the QC brief is new. We just uh, we just started this uh, during this campaign with a buddy of mine, Michael, um, who also has a, a, a long you know uh, time in uh, as a staffer and he has a pretty uh, good experience in politics. We thought, look, it'd be interesting just you know to to give people a little briefing twice a week, you know, if we have the time. So we usually record in the morning. Um, but the backstage, th this was something that was, you know, in the back of my mind for a long time. I used to work in politics for a pretty long time from 2007 all the way to 2018. Uh, and, and, you know, working as a staffer, you always have to be careful about what you say. And, you know, there's always, you know, this scrutiny that we're always uh, uh, watching for. And uh, so I always thought, man, you know, this looks like it's fun, right? I have a very good friend of mine who's a stand-up comic here. His name is Pantelis, and he had a podcast, and that's how I was introduced to podcasting. And he started like really early on, like in 2010, when no one really in, I'd say Canada, knew what podcasting was. You know, unless you were following what's happening in the U.S., you know, with Joe Rogan and Mark Maron and all these bigger guys, nobody really knew what podcasting was. And uh, he was on that trend, and uh, I started following seeing what he was doing and i thought you know one day this this, this could be interesting i i wish i could just do one now but you know you got to be careful what you say you don't want to you know uh put yourself in any uh, bad situation so as soon as that chapter closed in 2018 you know i was a candidate in those elections in quebec and uh, unfortunately i didn't win but uh, those ended in october again october 1st and uh, I took that rest of the year kind of just to figure things out. And uh, immediately in January, uh, the podcast was born. It was almost immediate. I knew that exactly what, what was going to happen. And yeah, we've it's been going uh, pretty steady, I'd say, since then. I mean, there's been a few moments where uh, I had to take a break there. But uh, other than that, I mean, um, yeah, it's a lot It's a lot of fun. I don't, I don't know about you there, uh, but uh, I don't know how you're enjoying it. But it's uh, for me, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's, been a, it's been a great experience. Well, I, I come from the same background as you. I was a political staffer in Ontario for some time. And then after an election, I became, as, as political staffers do, became redundant in a minority situation when my M MPP lost an election. So I then became uh, sort of obsolete. And then I went back into the journalism field where I came from. But uh, this show has, has spawned a lot of conversations and a lot of interesting uh, back and forth. And we've had members of all parties and I try to do that because I think everyone has the right to have their voices mm -hmm. heard and when I found your show when I started following you on Instagram I was like this is exactly what I'm doing but it has the Quebec spin and right. as a Albertan now a former Ontarian I, I found it so interesting to get a sort of behind the scenes look because you, you do the same thing that I do in some senses relax the guest that you have on and it's not a he said, she said interview. It's a just a conversation between two right. people. Yeah. See, people people often don't realize this, that, uh, you know, politicians are also human beings. Right. And I mean, we've seen this up close and personal because mm -hmm. of, you know, our, our, our job behind the scenes. 
uh where you know that's exactly how the name came about right the backstage i mean that's a, a term that we often use um and, and it's it's fascinating to me because every time the cameras are rolling you see a person right it's the politician speaking and regurgitating whatever lines that come up uh you know, you know they come up with uh in the morning you know they all get the email with their lines and we know how it works uh and what what do you mean they're scripted what? i would never have assumed that george Who sends these lines <laughs> nobody sends anything uh so and it's a completely different thing when you put them in a setting where they're more comfortable and you kind of tell them look dude this is not you know it's not cbc it's not your big broadcasters here this is just you and i let's just have a conversation and obviously you know, you, we try as much as possible not to put them in any uncomfortable situation. We know how it is, you know, and uh, we don't want to uh, develop that reputation either that we bring politicians and we bury them. Uh, and most in most cases, they, they seem to appreciate it. And it's 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 fun for them as well to just kind of unwind a little bit and, uh, you know, get, get out of that um that lane that they're in where everything needs to be structured and you know I'll, okay what is he going to ask me and how do i answer and it's a constant battle in their mind about what questions can potentially come up right and my last question on this subject before we actually turn to the crux of the interview yeah. and that is the election um in my show, I, I can tell you that we started off very small and we started bringing on some politicians. But when we got bigger and we started inviting, say, the conservatives out in Alberta onto the show, then the NDP started saying, well, we're not coming on because you have mm -hmm. conservatives on. Yeah. Have you found that in Quebec no. or in Quebec? No. Is it very much open game for yeah, you to yeah. invite? I've never I've never I've never seen that. And especially with the other uh, segment that I started in uh, 2019, I think, in the federal election, uh, I did the car ride conversations where I thought, look, I can't I can't invite people in my studio. I mean, I know how elections are. No one in their right mind is going to leave, drive to my place. God knows how long it'll take, spend an hour and then drive back like it's precious time taken away from the campaign. So I thought, look, I'll just bring the podcast to them. It's nothing. It's a camera, a couple mics. Um, and and uh, it was it was really it was really uh, awesome. It was really exciting to do that. And a lot of these people now, every time there's elections, they they're like, hey, are you doing that show again? Uh, and they don't care that, oh, you brought the other guy or the other girl. And why are you doing? That? And I mean, everyone knows my colors. I was a liberal staffer. So naturally, I have many more contacts in that party. But in general, it's uh, no, it's been uh, it's been good. I haven't I haven't received any of those uh, any of those messages. Well, it's going to are be you, interesting. Are, are, I'll continue on. Sorry, are, are you originally from Alberta or you moved from Ontario? To I Alberta? moved from Ontario. So I'm originally from Ontario. I grew up How in is a, that transition from east to west. Ah, uh, let's be honest. I, 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 I'm, I'm the same colors as you. When I was a staffer, I, I worked for Dalton McGuinty under okay. the Ontario Liberals in Ontario during, I think, at the beginning of your time uh, uh, when you were in the uh, National Assembly working as a staffer there. And moving out to Alberta, I can tell you it was a, it was a change because it's conservative country out here, right? And I, I saw the transition from conservatives to NDP. Right. And for transparency's sake, everyone knows this. My husband is the former member of the Legislative Assembly who was an NDP cabinet minister under Rachel Notley. So I have this weird thing on my show where conservatives at first didn't want to talk to me because they knew my husband was an NDP. Right. Now that I have conservatives coming on because I, they seem to be friendly to me, they, the NDP doesn't want to come on because <laughs> they, they seem I'm too friendly to the conservatives. So I'm right. in this weird fickle spot right now in my show. And it's, it, it's okay. great to have a, I, I, I don't want to say like-minded person on the show to talk about politics. But yeah. uh, when I knew that you were a liberal staffer, I was like, I need to get him on. I need to have this conversation because I feel like he's doing the exact exact same thing that I'm doing, but the transition out here, night and day. Yeah, I can yeah. tell you, I can tell you, Albertans talk about Quebec more than Quebec talks about Alberta. That's the I only don't thing doubt I that. I don't <laughs> doubt that for a second. And you, do know you, what, you know what's strange? There's a lot more similarities than there are things that are different. Yep. Uh, the fact, uh, and of course, I, I, I don't adhere to that discourse, but the fact that there's a province that thinks they'll be better off uh, by themselves than within the rest of Canada. I think that's something that should be bringing Alberta and Quebec together, but it's not. <laughs> we could talk about that for a full hour if you want to charge. <laughs> but let's talk about this Quebec election because we yes. are days, if not hours away, depending on when people are listening to this, from the vote. Uh, I have watched this uh, unfold and I can tell you this has been the election, like Ontario, about nothing. It oh. seems like nothing has happened 
Like there's been a few controversies from time to time, but every election has those. Mm-hmm. From, a, from an insider's perspective, from someone looking at it on the ground, has this election been about nothing? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, 100%. Uh, it hasn't been the most exciting election. Uh, I think due to the fact mostly that, you know, going into this election, Premier Legault had such an advance on on on, uh, on the other parties and his adversaries to the effect that everyone kind of knew what the outcome was going to be off the bat. Um, I mean, when I think right before the campaign, he was close to 45 or 43, depending on the pollsters percent. So when you think that almost one out of two Quebecers is supporting uh, Premier Legault automatically gives you an indication of what the result is going to be. And, autom- and that kind of brings down the interest in following the election. I mean, you, is there really a point in finding out what each party has to present when we know what the outcome is going to be? So you're right. It hasn't been that interesting. Uh, interesting. There have been a few moments here and there. Lately this week, there uh, uh, th- there's a few controversies, especially around immigration. Uh, but that has been going on from the very beginning. And I mean, they're 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 digging up old clips of premier logo back in the 2018 election about immigration so this seems to be a constant kind of thorn on his side but it's not uh, moving the needle though is it like it it doesn't seem like it no it's not moving the needle at all but i mean for your listeners just so they could know i mean quebec is one huge province and aside from you know, maybe a handful of big cities, you know, like Montreal, Quebec City, Sherbrooke, Laval, you know, Longueuil. Uh, the rest of Quebec is all regions, right? And uh, it's a completely different reality, uh, urban to um, to rural Quebec. Uh, and Premier Legault in 2018, he established uh, his presence in pretty much all of the regions in Quebec. He destroyed the opposition. Uh, and he seemed, and it seems as though he's going to double down this time around. So, People are thinking, is he just playing into his clientele? Is this his electorate? And he really doesn't cater to the big cities. And by big cities, obviously, we mean Montreal, because I think that's where the Liberal Party is going to be uh, reduced to, with the exception of maybe one seat out in the regions, in uh, the Outaouais region, uh, where Gatineau is, uh, just uh, right across Ottawa. Um, So people are thinking, look, it's a strategy. Uh, Is it wrong? Is it right? I mean, it's up to people to judge, but... uh, I mean, look at the numbers he got last time and look at the numbers that are projected this time around. Is he doing anything bad? Probably not. In Ontario, in the last Ontario election in 2021, I was on the ground and I can tell you the apathy that residents and uh, like just Ontarians had for that election. Because like you said, you see the polls and if you see a large majority win already, you're not going to get involved. Are people are parties having a hard time even getting people involved yeah. to actually volunteer mm-hmm. because oh my god yeah yeah <laughs> except look traditionally the party that is in government has more resources the, the the parties have more money they can invest more it seems as though that they have a better organization so it does make sense that the CAC Premier Legault's you know uh, Coalition Avenir Quebec is much more organized on the ground um, two points on that one yes people. Do, there, there's an apathy in general, I, I think, and I have I'm suspecting that we're probably going to follow the same path that that Ontario followed, where the turnout was what just above forty percent, I think, in Ontario. I don't know if we're going to drop that low here in Quebec, but my guess is that we're probably going to hover around I don't know forty eight to fifty two percent, like in that in that in in that margin. I'm guessing. I I mean I don't know. I could be wrong, but uh, my bet is on that. Um, so in general, the population doesn't really care. Um, but more specifically in terms of the actual volunteers and the, you know, the, the, the partisans of each party, I think other than the, 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 the governing party, the CAC, and, uh, maybe a little bit the new, well, it's not a new party, but it, it, it has seen like a growth right now. The conservative party of Quebec, aside from those two parties, from what I see on the ground, there's very little organization happening in the other parties. Definitely not almost non-existent in the liberal party, uh, the PQ as well. Quebec Solidaire, which is a grassroots party, a left wing yep. grassroots party, does have a massive machine, massive, massive, massive machine. The unfortunate thing about this party is that their support is very marginal uh, and it's concentrated in certain regions. So they, I, I doubt that they will ever govern. Uh, but in those specific regions, like we're talking about Montreal, for example, um, uh, and, and in certain pockets in the regions of Quebec, they have a monster machine. 
Um, I want to talk about those two, uh, two of the parties that you just mentioned, and that is the Quebec Liberal Party and the Party Quebec Co-op. Yeah. Those are the traditional parties of Quebec. They have won every election going back since, I think, the 1970s, if I'm not mistaken. You probably know this a little bit better mm-hmm. than I. They seem to be in a wilderness right now. And your former party, the party, uh, the Liberal Party of Quebec, their the leader, Dominic Anglant, I apologize if I pronounced that last name wrong, um, hasn't connected with voters, say, as a John Charest or a Francois uh, Coulard did. What's going on with the Liberal Party before we yeah. turn to the Party Quebecois? She, she hasn't been able to catch a break ever since she was uh, uh, elected as a leader. Mind you, uh, and this all started, a lot of people are, you know, they, they've come up to me and they told me, you know, oh, Dominique, I'm glad, you know, she's lost completely you know, all, uh, the, the trust of all the members. And I, I don't necessarily think it's her fault. I think she inherited a party that um, slowly but surely was kind of disconnected from its base. Uh, and, and I'm just going to draw a huge parenthesis over here. I came in during the leadership of Jean Charest, and, you know, we can talk about Jean Charest all we want and whether he was good or not. I don't think he was perfect, but in terms of his leadership ability and his charisma, I don't think we've seen here in Quebec another leader like him at least in the recent history of quebec um there was would Legault the- not be there wouldn't Legault not be on the same level as sheree because he's pulling the numbers that sheree did yeah 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 no no we're talking about specifically the liberal party okay jean sheree was the type of politician that walked in the room and he knew nobody he would leave there as if he knew everyone for years that's the kind of charisma he had and i don't I don't know if Premier Legault has that, um, and we can talk about that later, but there's this ability that Jean Charest had to just connect with the base, and there was this rule of thumb when he was the Premier that if you get called from the writing offices, you drop what you're doing, and you immediately answer those calls, and I worked mostly in writing offices. I mean, with the, with a little exception, I was, I was very, you know, little on the hill, we used to place a call and within half an hour, there was a call. There was this priority set on the writing offices because Jean Charest had this understanding that these are the people working in these offices that have a direct relationship with the citizens, the electors and the base, and obviously the, 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 the militants, right? The partisans. And that's what we got used to. Now, when Jean Charest lost in 2012 and the party had a leadership race, they got, um, uh, Philippe Couillard, Philippe, who was yeah. a cabinet minister in Jean Charest's government, different different leadership style. This is a guy that was much more cerebral. He came in and said, we need to get from point A to point Z. Who do I need uh, to get on board on my team? And how do we get from point A to point Z? The, his entire focus was on that. And the results were uh, were obvious, right? I mean, for the first time in Quebec's recent history, there were four consecutive surplus budgets. The economy was booming in Quebec. Unemployment was at a record low. It hadn't gone better for Quebec, at least since uh, since we can remember. However, that disconnected so much the base from, you know, the guys that, you know, the, the, the ivory tower people that we call, right? Uh, and it was obvious from day one that they did it was almost neglectful right oh, don't worry about them we got more important business to handle and, and that trickled down that was a snowball effect despite the fact that we had a majority in uh, in 2014 from 14 to 18 which normally should mean that the party rejuvenates and it gets active and there's more members coming in uh that's a period that people are attracted to the party right and it was the opposite effect people went away from the party uh and i think that trickled down dominic on glad i think for her she just came in at the wrong time i don't know if this could be fixed to be honest with you a lot of people that i'm listening to are thinking that this may be the end of the liberal party i think that's a little excessive didn't, didn't lego say that during a st- campaign stop that he doesn't understand why the liberal party exists in quebec anymore yeah, he said it because I, I, I don't want to go back to what you're saying be, uh, about the Liberal Party and the Parti Québécois being the two traditional parties in Quebec. And it's true. Yeah. For the longest time, you had these two parties that occupied the middle, the, the center of the political spectrum. Um, uh, and depending on the context, they would shift a little left or a little right. The only main difference between these two parties essentially was the fact that the Liberal Party was a Federalist Party and the Parti Québécois was a Separatist Party. So their main goal was for one party to say that the other one wants to separate from Quebec, from Canada, and the other party was saying, look, the other guys want to stay in Canada. This was the main 
uh, debate happening forever. Uh, and it, sh- it kind of shifted in, in, in the 2000s when the ADQ came in the picture. The ADQ is the Action Démocratique du Québec. And it was a frustrated liberal, Mario Dumont. Uh, he was the, 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 the president of the, uh, the, of the youth wing who got frustrated. If, for those who remember our history, you know, the Charlottetown and the Meech Lake Accords that frustrated Quebecers uh, so much. And he kind of left the party and created his own party. And in, right away, like it happened in 93, created his party in 94. He got elected in 94 as the only, he was a very popular guy, very intelligent. Uh, and he proved to be a very good politician for the, long, for the longest time. He was sitting by himself in, uh, in the National Assembly. But in the early 2000s, when people were kind of tired of the old politics, right, the liberals and the PQ all the time, and it's always about federalism and separatism and all that stuff, there was this wave of support that just went to the ADQ. And suddenly there was an actual real third party in the National Assembly. Mario Dumont in 2008, almost, uh, sorry, in 2007, almost made government. He got 41 seats and Charest got 48, I think. So it was a very slim uh, 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 difference between uh, the two. And he got to the opposition. He kicked out the PQ. The PQ was second opposition. It was, we had never seen this happening. And I think that was the beginning. In fact, the ADQ became the CAC. The ADQ with a few people from the PQ, uh, you know, because uh, Premier Legault, for those who are wondering, he used to be a minister in the PQ government before. Um, it's very transitional in Quebec politics because you don't stick with the party that brought you sometimes and you get reelected and then you go on to bigger and better things, it seems like. I think I think they realize that sovereignty is uh, an issue that is no longer a priority here in Quebec. I mean, there, there's been, there, there have been two referendums, one 1980, one 1995. The 195 was really close, though. <laughs> I mean, let, let's be honest here. But with time, people have realized that it's really not the priority. And I think Premier Legault played his cards right. He said, listen, if we're going to stay on track with this federalism, separatism, and like this ping pong game back and forth, we're not going to progress. Uh, and he made his party. And uh, although in 2012, he wasn't clear on where he was with sovereignty, he thought, ah, we'll do one mandate without having to talk about this. And then we'll see. Uh, he realized later on in 2018, and they changed that article in their charter in the parties, that it now is a federalist party, but with nationalist interests, right? So he changed that, and automatically, he dipped into the liberal vote and into the PQ vote, automatically. So that goes to demonstrate that people don't care about that anymore, and they want just a party that's going to focus on, uh, on on just Quebec and uh, and the, the economic development, the, the, the social economic, the, the demographic changes in Quebec and all these things that are happening, uh, education, health, you know, the things that matter to, you know, your common uh, citizen. And he played into that really intelligently. And I got to say one thing, that was probably the fault that, the, the 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 wrong thing that uh, Mario Dumont did not do back because Mario Dumont in '95 supported the Yes camp, so he was on the camp of the separatist uh, movement. Had he chosen not to do that, I think that if Mario Dumont played his cards right and said that we're a federalist party, but we're a national, because that's essentially what he was. Mario Dumont was a conservative nationalist party, exactly what the CAC is today. Uh, I think that Mario Dumont would still be in politics today and he would have maybe become the premier of Quebec much earlier than now, the CAC. Uh, so I think that will may, maybe was a little you know, mistake in his strategy, but we're seeing exactly what he failed at. Uh, Legault is succeeding uh, at today. Parti Quebecois, the, the separatist movement in, uh, uh, I, I would say, Quebec provincially, is not as uh, strong as it is nationally with the Bloc Quebecois. Yeah, that, that is fascinating to me. Yeah, that's so that's me. where yeah. I'm trying to figure out what's going on here because federal politics plays a massive role in a lot of provincial elections. I have not heard Justin Trudeau, Pierre Polyev's, or even Yves Francois uh, Blanchet's name mentioned once during this no, campaign. And it, and it never does. It never does. Actually, I think in if I if I'm not mistaken, it was in 2008 where Jean Charest was criticizing uh, Stephen Harper. It helped him. Okay, provincially, when you attack the federal government, it benefits you. Uh, but see, we, we spoke about the immigration thing. Justin Trudeau has been attacked on the immigration front a lot. I mean, we have the, you know, the, the, the famous Roxham Road that 
you know, people are just walking in from the U.S. into Quebec and, you know, Quebec has no idea what to do with them. I mean, by the time that the federal government uh, figures out the whole process of um, of uh, of asylum and refugee uh, status, Quebec needs to take care of them. So it's a it's, it's a huge load uh, on the Quebec government. And this has become a huge issue. So, yeah, the, the, they are attacking the government, much less so this time around than the previous election, I got to admit. Now, it's fascinating to me, like you said, that federally the Bloc Québécois is much more, you know, quote unquote, powerful, like in terms of number seat numbers than the Parti Québécois is. And they're both separatist parties. I think that that has a lot to do with the fact that nationalists in Quebec want to have a strong voice in the parliament of Ottawa and they find that voice in the Bloc Québécois because it's the only uh, raison d'être of that, that party in Ottawa, right? So they think, look, they best represent our interests. And I think that has to do with it. But when you're looking at it provincially, uh, they look for the better interest of Quebec as a whole and separatism is not there. It's not, it's not in the priority. So I don't think it has to do with separatism. I think it has to do with who defends best the interests of the Quebec electorate. So federally, yeah, Yves Francois Blanchet gets a lot of support. One, he's a great politician, and I got to know him because he was in Quebec before with the Parti Québécois. He was also a cabinet minister, um, and look what he did. He brought the party from non-existence practically to what over thirty seats, which is a fantastic uh, achievement for him. But I think provincially, when you look at it, 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 it the, the scale is, is different. The Parti Québécois also, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, has gone through some leadership issues in the last few elections as well. They seem to be uh, with this we in this weird position right now, and you might know a little bit more background on it, where the the leader was attacked. There was a female leader who went and became the leader of the Bloc Québécois yeah. while she was a Parti Québécois, yeah. and there was a lot of issues going on there. Has the Parti Québec uh, the Parti Québécois effectively run their course and may no longer be needed because you have a nationalist like Francois Legault. Yeah, well, that's that's I think that that, that was uh, Francois, uh, Francois Legault's strategy. His strategy was to completely eliminate the Parti Québécois and he played his cards right. Like I said, he focused uh, a lot more on nationalism like what do quebecers want rather than separatism and i think it won him a lot of the support now with regards to the leadership the whole thing you're talking about martin Ouellet, who used to be a cabinet minister uh, under pauline marois government it did it, nobody talks about her nobody talks about her um she tried i think at uh, on two occasions uh, to attempt the leadership of the pq she lost um and then she left and she she attempted for the leadership of the Bloc Québécois. She got it and then she was just horrible at it and the members kicked her out. Uh, and now I think she started another provincial party. I think it's called uh, Environnement Québec. I'm not even sure what it's called. Um, she's not even on the map. Uh, okay. And I don't think that has affected at all in any way, shape or form the Parti Québécois as a party, whatever happened. Um, is I Paul think... St. Pierre uh, Paladon uh, yeah. like connecting with voters? We talked about Dominic and she not being able to connect with the traditional liberal base because the party's in sort of a bit of a shambles right now. Mm -hmm. But as uh, PSPP, I, I, I know that acronym because I listened to your show. Uh, have they has has he been able to connect and try to make the party a little bit here's, more relevant? Here's, yeah, here's the interesting thing about the Parti Québécois and Paul St. Pierre Plamondon. He started off this campaign with the projections that the Parti Québécois was maybe going to get one seat. And that seat is in Matan Matapédia, where you have a very popular politician by the name of uh, Pascal Bérubé, uh, a great, great, great parliamentarian, very popular in his region. And that's all the way east, close to the, Gaspé, uh, the Gaspésie yep. uh, region. Um, so Paul saint pierre Plamondon, off the bat, knew that this was going to be the biggest challenge uh, for the party. I think that he's doing a fantastic campaign of all the leaders. He's done the, the I, I can't even think of a mistake that he's done. Um, the polls, when we're looking at the polls from the beginning of the campaign until now, he's had the most significant increase. Actually, I think he's the only one with an increase. The CAC has dropped. The, 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 the liberals have pretty much stayed steady at around 15, 16, 17 percent. Same thing for the, the Conservative Party of Quebec. Quebec Solidaire, again, same thing, pretty steady between 14 and 16, 17 percent. The PQ left from nine or eight 
8%, and they're up at 16, 17, depending on the polls. Officially, when we're looking at the polls, they are the elector's second choice. Um, so, And that's huge for him. Now, is that going to reflect at all in the results? I don't know. He got lucky this week, Paul Saint-Pierre Lamelot. He's running for, um, for a riding on, uh, on the island of Montreal where he didn't really have chances to win. Uh, but uh, the, Is his the riding that the, the mail drop? Issue exactly. Happened? So you have the actual candidate of Quebec Solidaire, which is another separatist party. Uh, she was putting in her pamphlets and she removed the PQ's pamphlet and she was caught on video uh, from a, on a security camera. Obviously, that sounds, that's sounds like my MP. Yeah, yeah. So obviously that's illegal for people listening. You can't do that. You can't steal mail. <laughs> right. And she had to resign. So that's going to be big now. That's going to be a writing that everyone's going to be focused on on Monday because the Ke- Ke- Quebec Solidaire dipped in a lot into the PQ's vote. I mean, it's the only separatist alternative. So the people that didn't want the PQ but wants separatism, well, it's Quebec Solidaire. There's no other option. And last campaign, they did spectacularly well they went from i think three mnas to 11 which was a huge growth for them i'm not so sure what they're going to do this time around but with a quebec solidaire canon not in the picture anymore in his writing is he going to pick up that vote are people going to stay home i don't know but there are uh much higher chances now that post and people actually makes it to the house uh, uh, on Monday. So I don't know what the final result is going to be for the PQ, but to, to answer your question, he seems to be doing a very good campaign. Because he uh, doesn't have a seat right now, right? He's not he the doesn't. incumbent. He was elected, yeah, he was elected leader of the party and he was outside. He came from outside. Uh, so he didn't come in from any sitting MA uh, as a leader. Um, from what I'm seeing and from what I'm hearing, he seems to be reaching out to the PQ electorate. Maybe not to the to 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 the numbers that he'd probably want to, uh, but I have a feeling that they're going to finish uh, with with more seats than they were projected originally. Which obviously, I mean, look, they, they I think they 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 had eight seats in the house. I think seven or eight seats. I'm not so sure they're going to get eight or seven. So obviously, it's going to be a bad result in general, you know, for the Parti Québécois. But if you look at the projections from where they started before the campaign, which was maybe one, two, possibly two or three, I think that's the lines that he's going to use to justify, you know, the quote-unquote victory uh, for the party so he can kind of save his seat as a leader. Before we talk about the Conservative Party, I want to talk about the Quebec Solidaire because this party is one of the parties that I can't really understand because they have (laughs) have a joint (laughs) leadership. While uh, Gabriel Ndu, uh, du, uh, Dubois, and you'll probably pronounce it correct that I can, um, he is the face of the party. There is a co-leadership under this party. Ooh, okay, explain who this, the Quebec yeah, Solidaire this, is, because yeah. you said they're a separatist party, but... Uh, what, what? Quebec Solidaire, <laughs> look, Quebec Solidaire was created you know, with a coalition of several other separatist parties. So this basically is the extreme left fringe of the Parti Québécois that's separated. Um, and there's a few parties, you know, there used to be the, uh, what are they called? Uh, L'Union des Forces Progressistes. So the, 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 the Union of Progressive Forces, there was Option Nationale, there was Québec Solidaire. Um, one, the, the Union des Forces Progressistes disappeared completely. Actually, it turned into Quebec Solidaire, and then Quebec Solidaire merged with Option Nationale during the last election, and that kind of gave them a little bit of a boost. But bringing in Option Nationale, they are the hardcore separatists, right? Um, which wanted nothing to do with the Parti Québécois. So that kind of gave them a little boost. Essentially, for the people listening, they are a grassroots extreme left wing party uh there are some journalists here in quebec that are going as far as to call them radical left i don't know depending on how you define radical i mean i'll 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 leave that up to the people to judge but they are a grassroots really and that's why i said they have an amazing machine their organization is 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 really 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 effective uh the way that it's structured i mean it's 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 a communist party i mean they have a, a, a um a general secretary, you know, uh, <laughs> there's a general secretariat, uh, and then which is a weird structure because in reality, the actual leader of the party isn't even elected. If you look at the constitution of Quebec Solidaire, there's a general secretary that controls everyone, and then you have two co leaders, Manon Massé and Gabriel Nadeau Dubois. 
And this became a topic I remember in the debate during last election in 2018, where the leader of the Parti Québécois, Jean-François Lisée at that time, and this came out of left field. They were talking about health, and he thought it was important at that point in time to question Manon Massé, who was then the, she was assuming the leadership there uh, from the tomb, on who is your leader? How come we've never seen this person? Can you, and it was just out of, it's, and people were like, what? You're talking about health. What are you going on their party for? I understand what he's trying to do. He's trying to destabilize the party. Like, who are you people? Like, who's your party leader? Who, who's making decisions? It's not, it's not even you. Why are you at the debate? It flopped completely for the PQ. Uh, but it's an interesting point because everyone, everyone's wondering, who is this person that is hiding in the shadow somewhere and who actually, based on the constitution of this party, would have the power to tell Gabriel Nadeau-Dubois or Manon Massé, you're done, you're out, I'm putting someone else, theoretically, because they're the leader of the party. So the way that it's structured, I don't think it's ever going to happen. But yeah, to answer your question, they have this dual leadership kind of thing and they've shared their responsibility. Uh, but Gabriel is G Gabriel is the sort of the figurehead of the party right now because right he's now, the one who's been on the debate stages the entire time. Yeah, right? he he assumed the response. So the deal was that the first mandate was going to be uh, Mano Masi. So. 2018 until now, it's been Manomasi. She was the leader in the house. She was, and then I, I think last year or a year and a half ago, they, they switched, right? So she went to her, you know, the number two spot and he took over uh, because they knew that this mandate, I mean, it was his turn. Gabriel Nadeau-Dubois is a rising star in Quebec politics. Although I can never agree with anything this party has to say or do, I have to admit that this kid has this charisma. He's super talented. He is an excellent communicator. And he is the future, I think, of maybe even politics in Quebec. He, he, he carries that image of the young, uh, ambitious uh, person that wants to bring forth change in Quebec. Uh, because he was a leader of the student he was union. a student leader back in 2011 12 for the people following whatever was happening in quebec politics back in the reason why jean charret lost that election 2002 uh, 12 primarily was because there was this huge uprising in the student population with respect to the tuition fees um despite the fact that quebec has some of the most generous um uh, tuitions in north america and bursary programs um uh, you know these students thought that they they, 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 sh they should pay less and obviously i mean you got to compete you can't you can't you know the, the the money to pay the teachers comes from the tuition and if you're dropping those tuitions we had a huge crisis in quebec where some of the top professors left and went to teach either in ontario or in the u.s so you got to stay competitive and we're, we're 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 digressing here essentially he rose to fame in that period there were three main student unions and all three of those student leaders actually went in to do politics. Uh, two of them, uh, one never made it. Uh, she never got elected. The other guy, uh, Léo Bureau-Bluin, was elected under the PQ government in 2012. Uh, yeah, 2012. And then he lost uh, in 2014. And Gabriel Nadeau-Dubois came in by election, I think, in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere there. He was the only student leader that refused to denounce violence. It was horrible. 2012, I mean, the demonstrations on the streets were massive. We're talking about tens and tens of thousands of people. Like some people had even, uh, I think one or two demonstrations may have reached close to 100,000 people on the streets. It was massive. It was a massive movement. It was backed by the unions. Um, they, they, they threw money to these kids. They coached them on how to speak effectively, on how to organize. It was this huge attempt to overthrow the liberal government through the student uh, union uh, groups. And Gabriel Nadeau-Dubois was that rising star that came out of that movement. And again, he, and, and now it's coming because he's the leader of the, of the Quebec Solidaire. So he's been questioned very often on uh, his image uh back in 2012 versus now and you know he's been very honest and said listen that was 10 years ago different mentality i was a student and and everyone is bringing that up they're trying to bring him down by saying that look he's the guy that in 2012 refused to denounce violence refused to denounce all all the the the, the, the crazy vandalism that happened in, in downtown montreal and in other cities he was the only one he, ne he never denounced it uh so he's assumed it he said look i've grown i've matured obviously He's taken a right approach. Uh, but yeah, that's Gabriel Nadeau-Dubois. And he, this kid, I, I'm telling you, he has a long future uh, in Quebec politics. 
the, the last part I want to talk to before we switch gears here and talk about the actual campaign and some of the issues that are facing is the Conservative Party. For those who don't know, the Conservative Party in Quebec has never really been an, a factor. Uh, it started a few elections ago. Uh, actually, the traditional- actually, actually, it's been actually it's been it's uh, it's been officially a party since the 90s, but nobody's known. OK, well, yeah. there you go. <laughs> yeah, I didn't exactly. even know. Yeah. But this this election looks like the election that the party could actually make a break and have a member in the National Assembly. Um, Eric uh, Dumain, I don't know him. Uh, I know that he does run in the federal conservative circles. Has he been uh, a good campaigner over the last 30 days? Yeah. Eric Dumain, for those who don't know, uh, started his uh, political uh, career, like you said, in the in the federal conservative circles. He's made a run when the ADQ, like I mentioned before, Mario Dumont was created. He played a huge role in that uh, in that party. He, he actually ran as a candidate in 2003 and lost. Um, I know that he's even um, worked with the Bloc Québécois in Ottawa, so the separatist party. Um, so it, it's it's a mysterious thing about Eric Dumain. And then for the longest time, he was this uh, you know this controversial radio host uh he went into journalism uh became very popular especially in the region of quebec uh, around quebec city basically uh and he rose to popularity uh and he took over the conservative party again for those who don't know the, this is a party that has existed I, I never knew the conservative party existed and had i not been involved in politics and looked at the ballots to see that oh no there's a conservative part of quebec there's a candidate geez wow okay they never got more than 0.8 percent maximum one percent of the vote um because really this is not- this is the issue that john sherry had during the during the federal conservative leadership in the last round was people out west said you're not a true conservative because you ran for the liberals and traditionally the liberals did what were more conservative than the exactly. federal liberals so so yeah exactly so in quebec the quote unquote conservative party was always the liberal. Like, I mean, people compare it to the federal liberal party because of the the name. One party has nothing to do with the other. They are really not linked like they are in other provinces. Um, and the, the, the liberal party here in Quebec always had that center center, right, uh, kind of policy. So yeah, they, uh, they, they, they played the role of, you know, what the conservative party in Ottawa does. Um, so there's never been, a real presence of the conservative party, even though theoretically and you know legally they've existed since the mid nineties. Um, Eric Duhem comes in, and, and this, you know, we can talk about this afterwards if you want to talk about the potential new leadership of the Liberal Party. People are thinking the party's gone; it's gonna, you know, disappear. I think it, it's all about the leader. So, and to to prove that, to justify that example, look what's happening with the Conservative Party. They went and found one person that was really popular, very charismatic. An, an incredible communicator in the in the name of Eric Duhem, and he brought the party from you know barely existing, like nobody even knew they were on the map. A lot of people thinking, oh, it's a new party. A lot of people think, oh, oh look, there's a new conservative party. It's not new. Uh, he just brought it up to where it is. Record number in fundraising, record number in members. I think they have the most members of all parties. This is a this is a guy that took over the party like what seven months ago. So he's done an incredible job in bringing the party to where it, where it is now. Let's uh, you know, let's agree to one thing as well. I don't know if we had it not been for the pandemic the last two and a half years. I'm not so sure if Eric Zem would have been able to do what he did. There's a lot of frustrated people, you know, those anti um, uh, anti vaxxers and anti you know COVID measures, uh, you know that that whole kind of gang, uh, those convoy trucker supporters, kind of people that, that 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 are supporting, and I think that pretty much explains this wave of support. But Eric Duhem is really not to be ignored. Um, he's really, really efficient. His communication skills are, are are really, really amazing. He knows exactly how to put his message through. I've said this from the very beginning of the campaign. It feels from what I'm looking at and from what I'm hearing and from the people that I'm speaking to, it seems that he's underestimated. That's just my take. I could be wrong. They have them at maybe one seat, and that maybe one seat isn't even Eric Duhem. It's not his writing. The writing that may uh, get elected under the conservative banner is in both Sud. So it, it's not the writing that Eric Jem is running in. Uh, but of course, it's in, it's within the region of Quebec. So it's in the outskirts of Quebec City. 
Um, For those who don't know, Bose is where uh, the, the leader Lindy. of the Max yeah. Bernays. Yeah, yeah. So that's his, yeah, that's his old, you know, federal uh, riding. Of course, they're much smaller yeah. uh, provincially, uh, about fifty thousand electors. So that's probably the riding that may come in. I don't know. I that that's what the pollsters say. I have a feeling that they're underestimated. Like I wouldn't be shocked if there's more than one conservative MA elected on the 3rd of October. Again, does I that, could be wrong. Does that change know. the makeup? Does that change Quebec politics if the Conservative Party gets into the House of uh, the National Assembly? I, I think so. I think so. I mean, there's a new voice. I mean, look, look at how everything changed from the minute the ADQ came in. The dynamics changed completely, completely. So that movement has been growing steadily. It's now become the CAC and they're in government. They're going to have their second mandate now uh, from what it appears. Look what happened when the first Quebec Solidaire m a was elected back in 2008. It was Amir Kadir. Ever since that election, it's been multiplying. It's been growing. They got 11 last election. I'm not so sure if they'll be able to maintain 11. Maybe they're going to come up even this time, but I'm, I'm pretty much have them around that same number. Um, if the Conservative Party actually gets one person elected, I think it's the beginning of something new uh, in, in the makeup of, uh, of, uh, of Quebec politics. Of course, you know, you, I'm listening to commentators and analysts talk about the fact that this is all a culmination of what we've seen in the last two and a half years. It's COVID, uh, you know, it's all that happening. And it's just a wave that is going to dissipate and disappear after this election. Maybe they're right. Maybe, I don't know. But definitely having another voice uh, in the National Assembly is going to completely change the dynamics. You opened up Pandora's box when you mentioned COVID-19, mm-hmm. and I'm going to play in that box for a few minutes, if you don't mind. Um, anywhere outside of Quebec, people will say that they had the harshest restrictions when it came to COVID-19. But you look at what Francois Legault brought in as premier, as the CAC leader, as the uh, CAC government and the Quebec government. They had strict lockdown measures around COVID-19, probably the strictest in Canada. It looks like you are heading, the province of Quebec is heading to reward them for their handling of COVID-19 and the pandemic. Um, Yet again, looking at this from an outsider's perspective, COVID-19 doesn't seem to be playing a major factor in the decisions of what's going on in this election is it uh, on the ground well look premier logo is obviously campaigning on that track record that they handled covid and uh, you know i can assure you that even federally in the next campaign the liberals are going to come out with those same lines we managed covid and to them it's a success it's a victory right uh, and it is because managing a pandemic that no one had ever even experienced in their lives is obviously a a challenge that uh, we overcame and the government that was in charge of that is going to take the credit for it. Uh, So yeah, he is campaigning a little bit on that track record. Uh, He's continuing on that same course to the effect that we need to make our healthcare system better in Quebec and, you know, take care of our schools. So they're continuing on that path. It's not the main. It's not the ballot question. No, it's not the main topic of conversation. It's not the ballot question either. Um, what I what I want to say based on what, just to bounce off what you were saying, the people that were anti measures and anti vaccines and you know anti mandates and all that stuff are the loudest. Okay, and you know it's it's to be expected. And a lot of people thought that oh this is going to come and hit Lego right in the face. I was one of them. I thought that Eric Duhem was going to wipe the floor with Premier Logo. I thought because of, you know, his ability to communicate, he's going to challenge this government so much. Uh, it didn't happen. The debates, he flopped on both of those uh, debates. He didn't do well at all. And when we look at the numbers, uh, the majority of the Quebecers agree with the measures that Premier Logo put forth. So, you know, even though, you know, even though you're scrolling on Twitter or Facebook, you, you know, you see a lot of the the anti uh, discourse, right? Uh, because they're the loudest. In reality, when you look at the numbers, people seem to agree. And like you said, if he gets elected with more seats than than he got in 2018, well, that's indicative of people's support all around uh, uh, this last mandate. And, you know, the majority of this mandate was pretty much managing COVID-19. So, yeah. We, uh, 
here in Alberta, we do not have a large French population, but we do have French speaking Albertans out here. In Quebec, this election has seemed to be, uh, yet again, from an outsider's perspective, a French versus English uh, debate. Uh, Francois Legault has said, no, we're not uh, campaigning in English. We're not having an English debate. Our website is only going to be in French. And this has, I would say, put the other parties in a unique position because they have been trying to follow the lead of the current premier. Mm -hmm. Is English Quebec being left behind here? Because I will be honest, we are a bilingual country in Alberta. I have never heard either one of the two uh, leaders or NDP or the UCP ever say we need to have a, uh, a French language uh, leaders debate because yeah. we are a bilingual country in yeah. fr- in Quebec, you are a predominantly French speaking con- uh, province. Yeah. So I would not be upset that you only had a French speaking debate. Mm-hmm. Well, see, it's, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned it because you talk about, you spoke before about a, a ballot question. I think the divide and specifically Bill 96, which the government uh, passed, uh, has a lot to do. But the fascinating thing is that it's only in Montreal, in the greater Montreal area. Um, The reason why you don't have these debates in Alberta is probably because there there isn't that sensitivity in protecting the language. Obviously, you don't have the French, the, the Francophone population that exists in Quebec. And this is the paradox in Quebec. I agree fully with the French language laws. Had it not been for that, I wouldn't be speaking French. Okay, so I I don't disagree with having laws that protect the French language, especially given the argument that the government has been making forever that we are a minority in North America, not only Canada, in North America to be speaking French. We're talking about less than 2%, I think. And the huge, the biggest chunk of that 2% is obviously in Quebec. So the fact that you want to protect that language is, you know, I support that 100%. And here's the paradox, because now you have the Anglophone community in Quebec that feels that uh, they're being neglected, that they're being discriminated against, and they're coming up and saying, hey, you need to protect us as well. And the argument from the Legault uh, government has always been, listen, you are an English-speaking community in North America. Nothing is going to happen to your language. Nothing. You're there to stay. French, however, is something that we need to defend. We need to protect. So this is the argument. Now, so so for for the English speaking Quebecers, they are. It's this weird situation that they're stuck in because they represent a majority in North America, but the minority in Quebec. So it's a weird, it's a weird kind of reality to live in. Uh, Have the the other parties been trying to? Uh, focus their attention on that uh, Anglophone speaking. The, the Liberal Party, the Liberal Party has been desperately trying uh, to bring that up as the main topic. They are failing miserably because they failed to 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 represent the English speaking community throughout this entire mandate while Bill ninety six was being uh, worked on in committee. Uh, in fact, they they they, they you know they, they flip flopped. Uh, I, I don't know if you for anyone. I mean, nobody really looks at what's happening in committees uh, in any province. Um, what I yeah. did as a staffer because I was pay- yeah, forced to be yeah. paid to do that. Exactly, but you know, j- just to bring everyone up to speed, while they were you know going through the bill article by article, the Liberal Party made an amendment. They requested uh, an amendment to an article to the effect that French language would be imposed. In CGIP, and I don't know how it is in other provinces, but here between high school and university, there's two years of CGIP. Uh, you know, we call it college or CGIP, whatever. Um, and it's two years, and there's English CGIP and there's French, obviously. And the liberals wanted to, uh, pr- they proposed an amendment to impose French courses to English CGIPs, uh, mandatory, right? So, uh, so let's say you're studying in, I don't know, science or whatever, and, and you come from an English high school and you're going into an English CGIP, in order to graduate, you need to do three courses in French, which is impossible because these kids, these students don't have that level of French. Uh, and they realized the mistake. It was chaos in the English community. They're like, what the hell are you doing? Nobody consulted with us. And how can you make this decision on the fly? Um Obviously, in committee, everybody was looking at themselves like, are you sure this is the amendment you want to propose? Okay, (laughs) all in favor. So everyone obviously voted in favor of it. 
And then the Liberal Party, embarrassed, they had to admit that they made a mistake. And then they came back in committee and requested an amendment to their amendment. So it was just a botched thing. It completely discredited them with, uh, in, the, in the English uh, community, uh, in the Anglophone community. And since then, they have struggled to, uh, to regain their trust. So I'm not so sure how the English community will be voting this time around. For the first, well, not the first time, but there are two new parties that were created in this election specifically because of this. So you have Bloc, uh, Bloc Quebec, I think, or Bloc Montreal and uh, the Canadian Party of Quebec, some really fringe party. Like it's a one-issue party. They're not going to go anywhere. But it just goes to show you that there's two parties that were created to cater to the English community. So uh, uh, the Liberal Party is the only party, to answer your question, that has been desperately trying to get the English people and, and to bring the issue of the English language uh, to, the f uh, to the fore, but they haven't, uh, they haven't succeeded. And uh, I, I, again, I, I mean, you know, the, 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 the argument that we need to protect the French language is really, really, really important, especially in the regions of Quebec. And, uh, you know, with, with the exception of Montreal, I, I, I mean, you can yell all you want. I don't think you're going to get anywhere because even if you come into Montreal or the greater Montreal area where this bill is, is going to impact most of the electorate, there still are francophones living on the island of Montreal and, and around the, the island of Montreal that support Bill 96. So, and and we're going to see this. You're going to see there's there's going to be maybe one or two more writings that uh, that uh, that uh, Legault is going to pick up in, uh, on the island of Montreal, which justifies exactly the importance of Bill 96. Is so, Montreal the battleground in this election? It depends. Uh, it depends which party. For the Liberal Party, yes, they've they've reduced themselves to Montreal. It's. Uh, I mean, Dominique Anglade's strategy was wrong from the very beginning. She chased after Premier Legault on the nationalist front. She wanted to demonstrate that we are the real nationalist party, and I don't know how she did not see this. I don't know how her advisors did not see this, but they were running by themselves. Like the 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 the, the CAC had taken that. They had won that title, and they were long gone. We were. You know, the Liberal Party in, in, in Parliament, they were debating, they were arguing, not, not with the government, which is their job, they were arguing with the other oppositions on who was the most nationalist party. So Legault was just laughing. He's like, okay, yeah, you guys argue between yourselves on who's the nationalist, the more nationalist party, and we'll just flank the Liberal Party and claim that we are not the, the party of the economy, which was forever the brand of the Liberal Party of Quebec. It was the party of the economy, the party of great projects and huge advancements in economic development. That was the one thing that no one can take away from the Liberal Party. Premier Legault did it, and he did it masterfully. And now the Liberals have nothing. They have nothing to campaign on. So they're looking for scraps. Um, Dominique Anglade's main element in her platform was in the, uh, uh, the project called ECHO. So she's focusing on green hydrogen, uh, you know, ECHO meaning ecology and economy. So she's merging, you know, the environment, uh, environmental policies in, uh, so that they can boost economic development. It really isn't sticking. It's just not going anywhere for her. Uh, and, you know, people are wondering, is this what we're reduced uh, to? You know, there's a lot of frustrated liberal uh, members that are thinking, look, you, you, you took us down a wrong path. We lost that you know, that status, uh, that that image that we're the ones that can battle for the Quebecers uh, on the economy and we're stuck. We're left with nothing. We don't have the credibility to fight for the environment because that's more Quebec Solidaire that has that credibility. So really, um, you know, the Liberal Party of Quebec is floating in middle in, in midair with nowhere really to grasp on uh, their base. They've lost it when they chased after Legault to 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 to. to to fight for that title of, you know, the most nationalist party. Obviously, Dominique Anglade went and did that in the regions. She started this huge regional tour uh, and she created this charter of the regions uh, to, 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 to promote the idea that regions matter and they're going to have a better place in policymaking and all that stuff. Uh, and while doing that, she lost her base in Montreal. Essentially, Montreal, uh, the region of Montreal, the greater region of Montreal, the Outaouais region, uh, and the region of Quebec was those three bases was unshakable. It was the liberal fortress. I mean, the worst case scenario when I was there, uh, they were always telling us, you know, worst case scenario, you know, like in the worst case scenario, the liberals are going to guarantee at least 45 seats. We knew that it was all calculated. Um, it was a you knew lesson. what seats were you could go for. You knew the safe seats. Exactly. But 
liberal brands across so the liberals now yeah so the liberals now realize this and they're fighting now in this election to maintain that in one battleground which is the island of montreal i'm not sure what they're going to be able to do uh, i mean premier legault had managed to come in and go, uh, he got two seats on that island quebec solidaire made some gains and there are some writings on the island that risk uh, that the liberals risk losing uh at least i can think of one or two maybe uh, yeah one or two that are probably going to go to the cac and two that are probably going to go to Quebec solely there. And one of those two that might go to Quebec solely there is the actual seat where Dominique Anglade is running in. So it's going to be interesting on the 3rd of October. So I, I, I know we're at the hour mark, but I, I do have a few other questions, if you don't mind. Do you have an extra you can, 10? You can go as long as you want. Don't worry about it. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I want to talk about uh, immigration because that is the one theme that has been over and over again, making uh, news headlines here in Western Canada in this election in Quebec. Um, Francois Legault has put his foot in his mouth a few times about his, times, yeah. his recent uh, announcement saying 50,000 new immigrants would destroy the culture. And I'm yeah. paraphrasing it would here. Be of, suicidal to quote him. Exactly. It would be suicidal, suicidal right. uh, about that. Um, how has no party decided that this was the issue that they wanted to run on? And I, I say that with respect because in Western Canada, it there's a sense, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, which I guarantee you will, that Quebec is anti-immigrant because with Francois Legault, you're anti-immigrant with the bills about the religious freedoms and the religious symbols. Um, how has no party capitalized on this issue to go after the religious immigrant community? Yeah. It's a very good question, and and I can't say that they haven't. Uh, but it hasn't been making waves, though. No, but it goes back to what we we're seeing initially, where Premier Legault has been catering to a large clientele in Quebec that are completely unrelated, and they're, 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 they don't understand the reality. Immigration in Quebec, essentially, even though every leader is saying that the trick with immigration is to get the immigrants into the regions. And it makes sense because you want to stimulate the regions. Everyone that comes to Quebec wants to go to Montreal, uh, which I understand why. I mean, it's the, it's, the, it's, your, it's the economic engine, right? Everything happens in Montreal. But strategically, uh, they want to transfer these immigrants into the regions because they want to build up the economy. It makes sense. Uh, the problem is that the regions have absolutely no idea what, immig what an immigrant looks like. Uh, it's a completely different reality. The urban and the rural, uh, rural, rural Quebec and urban Quebec is just one giant clash. Like it's, it's really, really, really um, two different worlds. So even if the opposition parties want to hammer that nail it won't stick because the majority of the quebec which is regional doesn't really have an opinion on immigration um immigration is a huge part in quebec's economy it's always been quebec has been built primarily on in fact all of canada has been built primarily on immigrants right uh, on the backs of immigrants um it hasn't stuck and look we started this off talking about Legault's. Uh, mistakes and blunders on immigration. This is not new. It's been going on since 2018. And there's some clips circulating now. He was questioned in, in 2018 election about the process of immigration. He didn't know how it works. A journalist asked him, how long does it take for someone to get their selection certificate? And he's like, well, a couple months. It takes three years. So he was like, it's embarrassing moments like this that are accumulating and still nothing sticks. Uh, the most recent one that you're talking about, it wasn't only Premier Legault that said it. He was he was giving a speech. It, this happened yesterday in front of the uh, huge crowd. It was organized by the Montreal Chamber of Commerce, and he was explaining economically, uh, you know, the strategy with respect to the immigrants and how there cannot be more than fifty thousand because taking in more than fifty thousand, according to him, and this is a direct quote, would be suicidal for the nation of Quebec, for the culture of Quebec, for the French or whatever, you know, um, which was shocking. I mean, what the hell just came out of this guy's mouth? And then the same time, there's another uh, article that comes out where Jean Boulet, Minister Jean Boulet, who is the actual Quebec immigration minister, last week in a debate that was organized by uh, Radio Canada, he completely... I don't even know how these things came out. Like, I mean, first of all, it's factually wrong. He was saying that 83% of immigrants um, 
They go to Montreal. They don't speak French. They do not work. They're unemployed. And they have nothing to do with the values of Quebecers. I mean, this the, this is serious to the point where Premier Legault actually had to come out and uh, denounce what his own minister said, his own immigration minister that should know these numbers, right? Um, so, and yes, he's not getting that portfolio back after this election. Well, Premier Legault had to make it clear. He couldn't just say, mm, no, I disagree with him. He was like, I mean, we're talking about five days to the end. You got to be categoric now, right? And yeah. he said, look, uh, I don't disagree at all with what he said. And for sure, uh, he just disqualified himself from being the immigration minister. I think he was kind enough not to say that he just disqualified himself from being a minister altogether. But the fact that he kind of planted that, but at the same time, uh, how can you, how can you, uh, how can you criticize the minister for saying something like that when the message from on top is not far, far off, you know, it's not that different. So uh, Premier Legault has struggled with the whole issue of immigration but again, the only people that it affects is the greater Montreal area. And um, that's not necessarily uh, the CAC's demographic, even though he might make gains in Montreal, which is which is fascinating. <laughs> um, I want to turn to leadership now. Leadership, leadership, leadership. We talked about, about who the leaders are at the beginning, but I want to turn to after October 3rd. Um, I have listened to your show on uh, all your episodes of the P, uh, Q, uh, QC brief, and I can uh, I want to ask this question: Is the only leader safe in this election, Francois Legault, or are the Quebec Solidaire, the Conservative leader, if they even if they don't make gains or win seats, they're safe because they have the popularity and the sort of the charisma to continue on? But the Parti Quebecois and the Quebec Liberal leader done if they don't make gains or win their seats? My personal opinion, I think everyone is safe except for the Liberal leader. Uh, and the reason, really? obviously, uh, yeah, and I'll explain to you why. Uh, obviously, Premier Legault is going to is going to make huge gains. So he's safe. He's the premier. He, you know, his leadership is never going to come into question until the day that he decides to resign, which, mind you, might happen in this uh, in this mandate. There, there are speculations about that. So forget about the CAC. The Parti Québécois, based on what we said before, they were projected to maybe win one seat. I think they're going to do better. And uh, Paul Saint-Pierre Plamondot demonstrated his ability to be a fantastic leader, an excellent communicator. Uh, he did a fantastic campaign. I don't see him in danger whatsoever. But isn't uh, going from 10 seats to three seats like a absolutely. horrible... Absolutely. Like, even if you're uh, a great leader, I'm looking at your my leadership and I'm going, ooh, maybe I'm not the best yeah, guy to lead yeah. this party anymore. But but, but look, at the, look at it this way, Chris. I think they have uh, seven or eight seats uh, right now currently. Paul Saint-Pierre Plamondon came in when the party was literally destroyed. So when he came in as a leader, already the PQ had very low uh, projections to begin with. So his argument is, I came in to bring this party up you guys had us disappearing. And of course, factually, I mean, you had eight and you're going to be left with maybe two, ugh, at most three. It's it's a bad result. But the argument is that the reason they have three is because of him and not zero or maybe even one. So I don't think he's in danger. And I think he's proven himself to the membership of the PQ. So I think he's going to be fine. Quebec Solidaire, I mean, Gabriel Nadeau-Dubois is a god. He's not going anywhere. Even though he, I don't, I don't see them making any gains. I think uh, they might actually lose seats. If not, they're gonna, they're gonna come out even. Uh, but Gabriel Nadeau boy, he's he's royalty. He's not going anywhere. Uh, obviously, Eric Duhem. We just spoke about how, you know, miraculously he brought the party from non-existence to, you know, being the the the, the object of the subject of every other party. They're they're all talking about him and what he's proposing. Like he's brought himself to relevance right uh so really the the big question mark now is the liberal party of quebec the liberal party of quebec suffered probably one of the biggest losses in its recent history in 2018 they went from government to 27 or 26 seats it was a slap in the face especially considering what i told you before for the longest time we knew that in the worst case scenario we're left with 45 seats at least and that didn't happen we went under 30. Um, now, Dominique Anglade has a huge, she had a huge responsibility of making sure that we didn't lose more. 
uh, and she will fail at it miserably. We're gonna, I, I, I'm projecting less than 20, probably around 15 seats. It's a huge, it's a huge loss for the Liberal Party uh, to the point where a lot of pollsters are wondering, are they even going to stay in opposition? What if the Liberals do so bad that they go into second opposition? I'm not so sure if that's going to happen, but uh, it's not going to be good. It's not going to be pretty for Dominique Anglade. And I've spoken this on many of my episodes on my podcast. I think that Dominique Anglade on the, on the night of the third or on the morning of the fourth, will be giving her speech, her resignation speech. I, I'm convinced. Uh, I'm. 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 Con- I mean, there's nothing more convincing that I that, that I can say about you know the leaders in this in this election, um, to the point where I think at this point, if I were her, I'd probably be crossing my fingers to lose my own writing. Uh, and we've spoken about this with Michael on the QC brief. If you had to choose between losing your writing and saying well that's it i mean you know i got the message and it's time to turn the page or winning your writing but having to face this embarrassing result and having to resign afterwards i would probably pick the defeat look i lost uh, you know respectfully i agree you know, this is democracy thank you very much it was uh, it was an honor and uh, moving on to other better things and that's it you're done um because don't forget also there's a lot of people that i've been speaking to that have been, you know, telling me that there's these murmurs going around that Dominique Anglade wants to remain on board. That I don't see happening. I mean, I don't even, I, I don't, uh, first of all, I don't even know if it's true. Uh, I mean, they're all rumors just coming back to me. But if that were the case, uh, I mean, it's completely delusional. Uh, so I guess we'll have to wait on the third to see what's happening. But personally, it would shock me that she doesn't resign. You are, I, I, I don't want to say this in, in lightly, but you, you, you know Quebec liberal politics. You, you were the inside guy. You were on the backstage for some time. Um, I, I'm going to ask a poignant question here, and please, uh, I apologize if it comes off insincere, but is it because she's a woman that, that, that she's having issues right now? And, or I, I, I is it because she's a black woman? Yeah, that, that I think, probably comes up more often but the, the the woman factor no because look we had a premier she was a woman Pauline Marois she didn't last she long didn't. she didn't last long but she was elected i mean electors chose her to be premier so um i, I don't know if the woman thing has anything to do with it maybe i mean i i, I don't know okay. um, and then my follow up question to that is could there have been a, another candidate who could have done better if it wasn't dominique this is this is the you know this is the hypothetical question that everyone is asking because we didn't you know the Liberal Party did not have a proper leadership race. The leadership race started in 2019. At the end of 2019, uh, there were COVID. two candidates officially. <laughs> there was Dominique Anglade and Alexandre Cusson. Alexandre Cusson was the former mayor of not, not a real big city, but a, a, you know uh, you know it was a, it was a Drummondville. Um, it's okay. It's a medium-sized city, you know, but he was well known because he was the chairman of the uh, the municipal kind of union council. So all the municipalities, all the yeah. mayors sit on kind of like a, a, a board there, and he was the chairman of that board. So he kind of um, uh, built his credibility and, you know, his leadership, uh, and that uh, board negotiates with the government you know, on different aspects, on transfer uh, funds to the municipalities and all that sort of thing. So he gained a lot of reputation for from that from that role. So the, the the leadership campaign starts. COVID hits. This guy now has stepping down from his role as the mayor of Drummondville to assume fully 100 percent this leadership race. So he has no income. He's living off whatever savings he has, and he said it. He was very honest and said, "Look, guys, I calculated." this many months to do this leadership campaign he calculated everything perfectly COVID came changed everything because the party postponed uh, the 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 date and he wasn't able to, to to live i mean i mean the guy he's got to feed himself so he stepped down and the liberal party crowned dominic angla so there wasn't a proper leadership race to begin with um would there be someone better i remember in 2019 there were some whispers of bringing other people from the outside into the campaign my uh my uh uh you know my opinion is that they probably saw the the downward trend and they didn't want to have to deal with that um and we're talking about 
you know, very popular, influential, very talented people. Like uh, I'm thinking about uh, Pierre Moreau, who served as a cabinet minister to Jean Charest. Very popular. He ran in the leadership race and lost to Philippe Couillard, actually. Um, uh, so, Jean Charest's not doing anything these days. Maybe yeah, he should come back. I, 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 think, I, think, I think that page has turned for him. I don't, I don't see him coming back. But, um, I, I mean, it's... Uh, to think if anyone would have done a better job, maybe, maybe, I mean, we don't know. I mean, this is what happened. It's Dominic Anglade. We have to live with, uh, the party has to live with uh, the result. The big question now is what you mentioned before. Is the Liberal Party going to uh, survive after the the projected results were, you know, the, the that are about to come down on the 3rd of October? That's the biggest question. And that, in the next leadership race, because for sure there'll be a leadership race, I don't see Dominica. There's no way Dominic Anglad can stay on board as a leader. I mean, this is going to be destructive result for the party. The big question now is who wants to assume that responsibility of bringing up the party? And, uh, you know, I'm glad I, I want to talk about because we, we alluded to it earlier about, you know, it all depends on leaders. Look what happened with the conservative party. Uh, you know, Eric Duhem just boosted that party. Uh, and you know, nobody really expected that. Uh, so they're thinking, can that happen to the Liberal Party? Is there one, is there that one individual that has that leadership capability, the popularity, the charisma to get people excited and, you know, bring them back into the party and really bring up uh, the party? Maybe. I mean, people have been suggesting a couple of names. Obviously, uh, Pierre Moreau's name keeps coming back. I don't know if he's going to do it. The interesting no name, though, that has been circulating is Mario Dumont, the guy that created the ADQ party, the former you know, liberal, young liberal that left. Uh, and by the way, in the 90s, this is a guy that former premier Robert Bourassa, the very popular uh, uh Premier who managed to get over 100 seats at that time, uh, for those who, do, who remember, he had Mario Dumont as his protege. He he was selling him as the future of this party. This is how talented Mario Dumont was back then. So there's a lot of people that are coming out, and even publicly, there was a former member, uh, m &A, um, Norm McMillan, who was elected in Utah, where a uh, very popular guy. Um, he served, you know, many years uh, as a, as an MNA and you know minister and party whip. He's made, I think, two uh, two public appearances uh, saying that the only thing that can save this party is for Mario Dumont to come back. Is Dumont want it? Does he want it? I mean, look, if I were Mario Dumont, I would stay away from this. <laughs> like, a, like it's a disease. Mario Dumont has, he, he, tra he transitioned into media. He is on the most popular uh, news channel, TVA LCN here in Quebec. He has a great slot. He, he, has a, he's, he has his own show, doesn't he? Yeah, he has his own segment. He's on many segments on LCN. Yeah. He's on in the morning. His real show is in the, in, in the afternoon, at noon, I think. And then they bring him back at night. He's all over the place. He's uh, The, the likability factor is through the roof. The popularity factor is through the roof. Everyone loves Mario Dumont. That he's so good where he is right now. He's probably getting paid a lot of money. <laughs> so the fact that I, I, I don't, I wouldn't leave that. Uh, to come back. But then again, look, we, I've spoken about this on the podcast as well. There is such a thing called a political bug, right? So, and I think Mario Dumont still has it. It's still there. It's in, it's in him. It's just a matter of bringing that bug out or for that bug to start doing its work. Is it going to work? I don't know. But definitely, if there was a guy like Mario Dumont that were to do make this move, I do see the party bouncing back. But it's a huge maybe. It's a huge maybe. So in Ontario, the Ontario Liberals are in this weird position right now as well. They they don't have a charismatic leader. They just got decimated in the last election. While the vote went up, seats did not go up. Um, there have been speculations that there are some federal MPs who are looking at potentially mm. getting into provincial politics. Yeah. Would a Melanie usually, and I, the only reason I say that is because I know she ran for mayor of Montreal. Uh, would she potentially be a, uh, a, one of those star candidates that people are looking for? Is there someone in uh, a liberal MP that yeah. the Quebec liberals are going, maybe if Mario Dumont does not get in, we could start looking pro federally for a potential leader. Yeah, I, look, personally, between you and me, I don't think Mario Dumont is going to make the move. Um, yeah. But I have heard of potential uh, federal MPs coming down. I'm not so sure Melanie is one of them. I think Melanie Jolie is probably uh, looking at the top job over there. 
Um, the only reason I said one. Melanie Jolie is because she's kind of the the, the name, yeah, yeah. the Quebec yeah, but, star. But I, I think, in yeah, yeah, but I think she's good where she is, right? I mean, she 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 really surprised everyone with her uh, mayoralty run. She came in second, and she was practically alone, <laughs> you know. So uh, and against a pretty well known name it, as well, it was Denise Coderre. Coderre. It was Denise Coderre who won mayor of Montreal, but the runner, but like she came second, and she had no team, so people really elected her, particularly. Uh, she looks good. She's very pretty. She speaks well or used to speak well. I'm not sure about that now, but she's good where she is now. So I think that maybe she, there's a potential for her to go grab that seat when Justin steps down. And I feel that despite the fact that Justin Trudeau actually told his caucus uh, last week that he's in it for the next race, maybe I, it's hard for me to imagine him running another election. I'm just putting that out there. I could be completely wrong. Is but- he well liked in Quebec? Oof, man, that's a <laughs> that's a big question. I I I I'm or is my, it the liberal brand that's well liked? I think he's done a fantastic job with a liberal brand. The writings that are liberal, he's like a god, but I'm not so sure. Um, I'm not so sure he's good. He, I, I I don't well look, he I, I can't remember the, the, the number of seats in the last fair election. I have a feeling that the Bloc Quebecois did better than the liberal. If not, it's maybe one or two seats different, something like that. So He's not, yeah. He's he doesn't have that popularity he had back in 2015. Um, my gut feeling is that by the end of this year, or early next year, he's probably going to step down. Uh, but again, look, he himself said that he's running, so I don't know. I mean, let's give him the benefit of the doubt, let's believe him. But something inside me tells me, yeah, you're a liar, you're stepping down. Uh, I, I've, for- I've said since day one, he's gonna last a day longer than Stephen Harper because Justin Trudeau, if anything, hates Stephen Harper more than anything. So <laughs> I counting. think the day after the, his long, uh, Stephen Harper's longevity of like nine years and 48 days, yeah. on the 49th day, Justin Trudeau announces, Well, guys, I've tra- taken my walk in the snow. So, so just to finish on that, I, I think if ever that were to happen, definitely people like Melanie Jolie would run. Uh, Philippe Francois Champagne would probably be interested in that seat as well, because a lot of people that are thinking maybe Philippe uh, Francois Philippe Champagne, who is, I think, the um, innovation minister or something like that federally, maybe he would make a jump. I don't see that happening. I mean, they're pretty high profile at the federal level, and I think they're probably going to stay there. However, in the Liberal caucus, some may remember in the middle of the of the pandemic, uh, a, a guy by the name of Joel Lightbaum came out and smashed Justin Trudeau. He really went countercurrent uh, with all the, the 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 health measures and you know the the, the, the saying the it was a de- divisive tactic for Trudeau. Yeah, to and also the people. lack of scientific evidence. I mean, can we see it? Can we, you know, tangibly? What does it mean? Where are where's the science that you're talking about? Uh, he wasn't excluded from caucus. And I think I went on record uh, saying that I think the reason he did that is because there may be other people in caucus that are pretty much aligned with Joel Lightbaum that don't necessarily want to come out. And if you had secluded him or thrown him out the caucus, you would have created a much bigger problem. Um, my That's just my gut, my gut feeling. So there are speculations that maybe Joel Lightbaum might make the jump. He's elected in a riding in, in the region of Quebec. Problem in the region of Quebec, it's Cack through and through. So if he makes the jump, is he going to make it there? I don't know if he's going to be able to come in. Maybe they're going to give him a seat in Montreal. I, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, the other thing that I've heard, which I think is far-fetched, but maybe a possibility, there was a recent leadership race in the Conservative Party of, uh, of Canada. The majority, if not all, except for one member of the co- Conservative Caucus in Quebec, uh, supported Pierre Poilievre, which was... Uh, uh, Paul Us, the rest of the Conservative Caucus didn't. Uh, following the result, Alain Rayez stepped down. He resigned honorably. Said, "Look, okay, I get the I get the message." Uh, didn't resign. He left the party. He, he yeah, he resigned as a um, as a conservative, conservative and, yeah. from the Conservative Caucus. He's sitting as an independent. I don't think he can win that writing uh, as an independent in the next election. So, what is he going to do? I mean, is he going to make a jump provincially? And if he does make a jump provincially, I want to remind everyone that Alain Rayez run with the ADQ, with Mario Dumont in 2003. He lost and then became the mayor of Victoriaville. And that kind of, you know, uh, uh, became a springboard for him to to run federally. Is he really going to come to the Liberal Party? I 
don't know. It's not like Mario Dumont who left the Liberal Party and created his party, which maybe they, by some miracle, they can kind of reel him back. Alain Reyes never was a liberal, or maybe, I don't know, maybe at some point he was and decided to support the, um, uh, Mario Dumont. I, I don't know, but I don't know. I'm not so sure if that is going to. So I, it I, sounds like you're saying that the only party that's going to be leaderless after the third is the yeah. Quebec liberals. Yeah, yeah. Is yeah. there someone in caucus right now that could potentially take that interim position? Because an interim leader is the worst job in politics. Oh, because you have goodness. to keep the ship sailing, but at the same time, you have to grow the, the party as well and pick up the spirits of people who have just been utterly defeated. So is it there is, a person? It is, it, it is a, a very difficult role. Um, they don't get much credit, eh? But the, the no. more they don't no. get, the only the one who I in recent memory that I can remember that got some credit was Bob Ray federally because yeah, he took the party in third place and kept it alive until Trudeau yeah. got yeah. there. Yeah, so it's a difficult, difficult task. The advantage, however, is based on what we're seeing. <laughs> That interim leader won't have too many people to manage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like around, you know, 15, 16 people, which is completely manageable. It's not like the oppositions were back in the day where you had 50 people or 40 people that, you know, became, uh, uh, you know, quite uh, tiring. Here's the thing. And this is the other uh, fact that is going to plague the Liberal Party. All your experienced m as resigned. They're not running again. So you have your Carlos Letaos, that was a former minister of finance, um, Christine St. Pierre, that's been there since 2003. Um, uh, what's her name? The other one. Uh, been a lot of uh, announcements of retirements, though, like even on the CAC benches and the Party Quebec Quebec benches, like this election seems like a very new slate of MH. Uh, yeah, well, the, MNAs. CAC, yeah, the CAC didn't have that many. The liberals, I think they were like 14 or 15 people that decided not to run again. And these were all experienced MNAs. Now, I understand, you know, you don't, you're, you're foreseeing another mandate in opposition. Chances are that, <clears throat> I mean, you know, why waste another four years? And let's, let's be honest here. I mean, you're not doing politics for the money. <laughs> uh, so all these people step down. There isn't that many people that I'm assuming will be reelected that have what it takes. Aside from André Fortin, who is uh, elected out of uh, the Pontiac, so it's in the Outaouais region, who will probably get reelected. Um, Marc Tanguay, who gets elected in the east end of Montreal, who's probably go going to get reelected. Aside from those two guys, um, everyone else is a rookie. They came in last election. And, and Philomena Rotiroti, who also gets elected in the east end of Montreal, who I know, I, I know her personally, she won't go for that. Uh, she, 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 she's not interested. So aside from those three people, I don't see, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know who's going to take on the interim role now. And the, let's be honest, Dominic could still pull this out. She could actually get above 27 seats oof, I doubt with it. the split that is currently predicted in the polls with the Quebec Solidaire, the Conservative Party, the Party Quebec, all hovering about that 14 to 16 range. Who knows what's going to happen on an election? Who knows? But I would I would be shocked if the Liberals end with more than 20. Uh, I have them around 15, 16. The other thing that I heard uh, one analyst comment the other day was that given the state of the party, if Dominique Anglade manages to win her seat, obviously that's a, the, 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 that's, that's a given, you need to, to, to win your seat, maybe she could assume the role of interim leader and say, listen, I'm going to step down. I failed, but I'll stay on board as the leader until the membership or you know elects a new leader. Maybe she'll, I mean, she'd be perfect for it, I think. Uh, even though the membership is so frustrated, they don't want to see her anymore. I mean, once you, once the election is done and over with, and you realize that there isn't really much left here, maybe she'd be the ideal person to assume the role, at least in the interim, um, and then step down. So I think it'll all be indicative of what's happening. I mean, we'll wait until the 3rd of October, and then we'll see who is going to, uh, uh, accept the interim role. If any of the two, either André Fortin or Marc Tanguay, take, take on the interim role, automatically we know that they won't be running for leadership. But if they both refuse to take the interim, it'll be indicative of, uh, for sure, they'll be running for leader. Um, is that the leader that the party wants? I don't know. A lot of people are suggesting that we need, we just need to bring someone from the outside 
it'll you know forget about the inside there's nobody competent enough uh to assume this role um or experienced enough and we need someone to really come and you know pick up the trash and clean up the house a little bit and uh, get us back on track so i want to i want to turn to my last question for you here uh george and that <laughs> is october 3rd we are days away if not hours depending on when people are listening to this in your best prediction this is not a race to be the next government. This is the race to be the next opposition party, in my in my opinion. Um, what happens on election night? What what are you what are you predicting that's going to be happening on election night? Is it going to be the similar of what we have right now? Liberal Party, Quebec Solidaire, and then the Party Quebecois, and maybe a few conservative, or what are you predict what are you expecting? I think it's going to be status quo. I think we just wasted a whole month to get the exact same result where the CAC is going to remain in government. Obviously, they're going to do much better. So probably around 95 seats, maybe more, maybe less, but around there, around that close to 100, which is a huge jump for them. They're, I think, 75 or 70, 76 seats now. So that's a huge success for them. Huge victory. Uh, I think the Liberal Party is going to maintain the opposition. Uh, I think Quebec Solidaire is going to... Uh, won't be able to maintain. There's four seats they have in the regions of Quebec outside of Montreal. I have a feeling that at least um, two or three of those might leave. Um, and depending on what they'll be able to pick up in Montreal, maybe two, I don't know. So that's what I'm saying. Either they come out even or they may even lose some seats as well. So they're going to stay in, uh, in second opposition. The PQ, I think they're probably going to do better than one. Uh, I, I, I honestly, I hope Paul Saint Pierre Plamondon wins. I, I, I really enjoyed him. I think he did a fantastic campaign, and as a leader, he deserves a seat in the house. I really, really hope he manages to pull that off in uh, in that riding in uh, in Montreal. And that's pretty much it. I who's I want the big to... winner of this campaign? Do you think? Oh, for sure, the CAC. Why? Just because they didn't really have any issues, or they yeah. didn't really yeah. run I, opposed? I, I, because when you look at them, I mean, they put in place. Uh, their policy in 2018. They came in and said, this is our plan and, and we're going to go forward with it. Were they perfect? Obviously not. No government has ever been <laughs> perfect, right? Not not every government has come out at the end and said, look, 100% of our promises were achieved. It never happened. Chances are it never will happen. Um, but when you look at the facts, I mean, they didn't do that bad managing the pandemic. Yes, the mandates were, were annoying, frustrating. Uh, I certainly was in favor of them being prolonged all that you know, up until recently, like right before the summer, they dropped the, the mandates totally. Uh, but when you look at the numbers, forget about what I think. When you look at the numbers, people largely support what the government did. So good on them. Um, he has a good he has a good health minister in uh, Christian Dubé. He has great economy ministers, whether it's the finance, Eric Girard, or the economic development minister, uh, Pierre Fitzgibbon. Uh, they're doing a fantastic job. Uh, I mean, whether we like it or not, I mean, we can disagree all we want, but they're putting in the numbers, right? So, and not only, so they, so they're at the position where they have that track record and additional, in addition to that, they gain 20 seats. Of course they come, they're the big winner. They can come out and say, Legault can come out and say, listen, this is what we're doing because the Quebec population wants this. And it's reflective uh, in the, in the support towards our party and towards our seats. And it's obviously reflective in the, in the in the polls. Obviously, I mean, it sucks to say that I'm governing based on polls, which is what Premier Legault has been doing. Um, but the people are supporting him. So, I mean, how can we come out and say you shouldn't be there? I mean, he has every right to gloat and to, to do whatever he wants. The big issue now, and this is obviously the line that the opposition parties are going to find, and this is what they did back in 2018 because Francois Legault was coming out and saying, listen, the Quebecers trusted us with the majority. We're governing uh, and we're putting things in place because Quebecers gave us that mandate. That's not really true because, you know, Francois Legault won with, what, 36, 37% of the vote. Can you really say that you're speaking on behalf of the majority of the Quebecers? Not really. Uh, but that brings us into a whole other territory about the electoral system. Which do people uh, want the electoral system changed in Quebec? Because it is not an issue out here in Western Canada. I can tell you that right now. Yeah. When people talk about proportional representation, there are a few party leaders who do, but it is a non-starter. But Chris, how many parties really do you have out there? Two? Oh, now Three? we now now we have two. 
Two, provincially, yeah. the NDP yeah. and the conser- the United Conservative yeah. Party. So it's not really an issue, but I mean, given the context now in Quebec, where there are really four parties, forget about the Conservative. We don't know what's going to happen. Maybe they're going to come in the House. We don't know. But really, there's four parties in the House, and I'm not in favor of an electoral reform. Uh, I mean, look, do your best, win the majority, wins, and that's it. Uh, stop, stop crying. And and also if. You know, I've studied European politics, and when you look at Eastern European countries that have this uh, uh, proportional representation system, it leads to unstable government because it allows more parties to come in. So it forces the government to engage in coalitions, and that doesn't really sustain itself, right? I mean, look what's happening in Italy. How many governments has Italy had since the Second World War? And you've seen that we see that in all these big countries in Europe. So it's for me, it, you know, it's a question about governance. Or representation, so it's it, it's a huge, it's a huge, you know, the camp. You know, which one do you choose? It's very difficult because, yeah, democratically, you want to choose representation. We want the votes to count. We don't want votes to go "quote unquote" wasted, like a lot of these parties suggest, right? Quebec Soli there says that a lot. It's a line that you you hear a lot coming from, you know, the left wing parties. These votes go wasted, and it's not it's undemocratic. And but that's how it is. I mean, look, people elect. The, the guy that got the most wins. I mean, you know, uh, you look at the Olympics, the guy that came in first by 0.01 second, he still came in first. You can't say, well, but, you know, you can't wait. Unfortunately, he didn't come in first. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, it, it, but I get it. I get it because when you're looking at a possibility now where, let's say we look at the polls right now, right? The, the conservative part of Quebec is hovering around 16%. Everyone is around 16% going for second place. But look, look at the disparity. The, 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 and we'll, we'll have to wait and see what the final percentage of vote is going to be, right? But assuming that it's 16% and the Conservative Party will get maybe one seat, probably zero, and the Liberals are going to get anywhere around 15, 16, you know, max 20 seats, <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it fascinating that they have the, the, same, the same support but much different number? Because well, it all comes down to where your base is, right? Because if your base is. is, if 16% of your vote is spread, spread out, out across yeah. 125 seats, understandably, you're not going to win seats. If your no. 16% is dedicated within like 20 ridings, then of course you're going to win seats. Exactly. And that's what comes, it happened in the Ontario election. The NDP and the Ontario Liberals got the exact same percentage of votes, but the Ontario Liberals just couldn't concentrate their percentage or their vote in certain ridings. They yeah. spread it out and that's what caused them to only get eight seats and not become party yeah. status. Like, look, I get the argument. I mean, for democracy's sake, yeah, let's not waste the votes, but and it's not something that's coming out of the top of my head. I mean, we've seen examples of it. Like exactly, like I said, in Eastern Europe, you have a lot of governments that are either coalition governments or, I mean, there's parliaments that have over 10 parties in there. Can you really govern with that, you know, you know, with that many uh, forces there? Uh, I, I don't know. So and no I, one's going to want to ch- once they get elected. No one changes the way that well, the people the, well, look, just got elected what, that way. Pascual Legault in 2018 promised that he was going to change the electoral system. He got Trudeau he said, did too. Oh, Trudeau did the same thing, obviously. Um, but look, the, the the counter argument to that is, well, look what happened with Quebec Solidaire. They got one person in in 2018 and they're up at 11. So it's possible. It is possible. It's a lot more work. But it's not that it's impossible. So, I mean, it's so complex to change this electoral system. And they were discussing like this mixed system here in Quebec where there's going to be a different um, regional um, uh, representation. Like it was kind of like I I honestly didn't even understand it. It all went, you know, it was all pushed aside. Uh, Lego doesn't want anything to do with it. Um, So, I mean, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Talking about, oh yeah, the percentage. So, uh, yeah. So, but it's still fascinating that, you know, you have a government with, well, in 2018, 76 MNAs, but only with 36 percent of the vote. I mean, it it is, it is a little weird. It's strange. So I don't know what's going to happen this time around. I, I, I think it's pretty much going to stay. The the composition is going to stay pretty much what it is now, uh, with the exception of the CAC that's going to get more. Not, not, not much is going to change, man. So I think that's gonna. It's, it's, it's kind of like in uh, at the federal election. You know, we we had a we had an election last year, and we got 
the exact same result. Literally, ridings just swapped a few <laughs> yeah. seats here and there, but overall, nothing much changed. Yeah. So, you know, the, but this time around in Quebec, it is going to change. Premier Legault is going to get a much bigger representation. So the arguments are all in his favor that he's doing a good job. And, you know, that's, that's that. I mean, we have to accept it. I mean, there's not much to say. George, I want to thank you so much for this conversation. This has been a fantastic almost two hours of talking about Quebec politics and also about what's going to be happening after October 3rd. Um, thank you so much. Uh, my pleasure. My pleasure. I can I can go on for more if you want, but uh, you know we both. Have well, we'll life. have you on afterwards so we can digest this, so yeah, that way yeah, we can sure figure we can out that. what happened. Um, so for anyone who wants to listen to the backstage podcast, uh, dads like us or uh, the QC brief, uh, the links are in the show notes. So if you want, scroll down, click on his links. Uh, George's Twitter account, Facebook account is there as well. So please follow him. Highly recommend it because he gives a, as you can just tell with the last hour and a half, uh, a unique perspective into Quebec politics. And it's always fascinating to uh, hear from different perspectives. So uh, George, again, thank you so much. Um, and I want to remind everyone, as I say in all my episodes, put down social media for at least five minutes a day. Go have a conversation with somebody. Helps our democracy, helps our society, and helps us be a better people. So with that, this has been a YouTube exclusive version of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking. <laughs>